Amen. All right. All right, I had a few different ideas on what I wanted to preach for you guys this evening, um, but nothing was really sticking, you know. Uh, it wasn't until Brother Jeff, I heard he wanted to preach on singing this morning. And, you know, I had this idea on the back of my mind for a while, and I thought, hey, you know, why not whip this one out? Uh, it's perfect timing. He's preaching on singing. I had one in the back of my mind about music, so why not? And, you know, if you haven't listened to Brother Jeff's sermon, go back and listen to it when you have the chance. It's a great, uh, great preaching on how singing is for our benefits, for God's praise. That's what it was designed for. It was for admonition. It was for building us up. All in the Lord, though. That's what singing's for. That's what music is about. And again, so I thought this evening, you know what? Perfect timing to preach on the topic of this particular type of music that I had in mind. Now, uh, because, because music, Brother Jeff kind of uh, mentioned it this morning, that music is a powerful tool. It is a powerful thing. It helps us remember things. It helps us remember doctrine. Uh, a lot of the hymns that we sing are very doctrinal. And, you know, having it be catchy and uh, ringing in our ears, singing it in our hearts all the day long, it helps us remember the, uh, the, the truths of the Bible. It, it's great. But um, uh, it's powerful in a way because our, our emotions kind of feed off of music. You know, Brother Jeff kind of mentioned it earlier as well. You know, some of the worldly music that we hear in the world, it really sticks with us. It goes down deep into our soul in, in a way. It engraves its, its lyrics in our soul to where, you know, like you could uh, take a walk down the street and you hear some wind chimes. The wind just kind of blows them a certain way. And, you know, and it makes a, a certain melody that all of a sudden the song that you haven't heard in like a decade, all of a sudden the lyrics just come right back to you. That's how powerful music is. It, it's really like that, you know. And, um, and, and you're saying, you might be like, okay, what do you mean? What is this about? Well, think about it. You know, why do we sing hymns in the beginning of our services? It's to ready or prepare our hearts for the preaching of God's word. Um, the world understands this as well. Uh, for example, thinking about a, a boxing match or a mixed martial arts fight. More often than not, you hear those fighters walking out to heavy bass or, or drums. Why? Because it prepares them for what's about to take place before them. It gets them battle ready. It gets them battle minded, right? So uh, if, if the world understands this, we should understand this too, because we as God's children uh, the Bible commands us to make melody in our hearts, sing hymns and psalms, to sing a new song to the Lord. And when music, when it comes to singing and listening to music, it's a, it's a beautiful gift that God's given us, uh, for, and specifically for God to glorify God. But of course, as the devil does, he turns what God has given uh, to us on its head. You know, uh, Satan from the beginning has always tried to mimic everything God does. He takes what's good and turns it evil. He takes what's pure and undefiled and perverts it. And music is no different. Uh, let me show you what I'm talking about. Uh, Brother Jeff made mention of this uh, this morning. Keep your place there in Luke chapter 6, but turn to Isaiah 14. Isaiah chapter number 14. And if you're familiar with Isaiah 14, this is the passage of Scripture where we find the name Lucifer, talking about Satan, the devil. And if you're there, look at verse number 9. It says, Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. And they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto thee? The Bible is very clear that Satan is not in hell right now. Uh, you know, a lot of people have it uh, in their minds in the world today that Satan is like this fat red guy with a pitchfork on the throne in hell, ruling and reigning in hell. That's not the case. The Bible says that hell, uh, that hell beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. Hell is a place that's prepared for Satan. Satan's not there. Uh, you don't have to turn there, but in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. So that's the devil. He's in the world today, walking about today, wreaking havoc on the earth. And let me tell you something. One of his many tools in the world that he uses is 
music. Listen closely to the rest of the verses we're about to read in Isaiah 14. Look at verse uh, 11. Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials. The worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which does weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit, upon, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. In the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And notice in verse number 11, it says, thy pomp is brought down to the grave and the noise of thy vials. What, what's a vial? A vial is a stringed instrument. Think about the instrument violin. Right. It's a vial. It's a string instrument. Okay, what's the significance there? Well, we see this fallen angel, Lucifer, which is the devil, has some sort of connection or some sort of taste for music. Yeah. Not only that, but we see that he wants to be like God. So this is the part of the battle today that God wants to win the hearts of men, but so does Satan. And, with, and he's doing that with one of the biggest weapons of the day, which is music. More proof of music being a key uh, tool of the devil is found in Ezekiel uh, 28. If you, you have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, look at Ezekiel chapter number 28. Ezekiel 28. And when you get there, starting at verse number 13, it says, Thou hast been in Eden. The garden of God, talking about Satan. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Talking about Satan again, and uh, talking about his tabrets and of thy pipes. Again, referring to musical instruments or some sort of music ability. Look at verse number 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou wast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. Again, signifying Lucifer or Satan's fallen state. And look, you'll, you'll, hear, pe you'll hear people say things like Lucifer was the worship leader in heaven or whatever. We don't really know that. All we could really see from this is that he was the anointed cherub. So clearly there was some kind of significance with his position and, and the fact that he had these instruments. That's all we really know, that he had some kind of vast music capability, that God created him to be so. That's all we really know. That's all we could really gather from that, that he had some kind of uh, uh, big position in heaven before his fallen state with music. And look at verse 16. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. And thou hast sinned, therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. That sounds like pride. That sounds like someone who thought they were just too special for their own good. Someone who wanted to be like the most high, like it says in Isaiah 14. And let me tell you something. That, that someone, the devil, is in the world today using those same vials, tabrets, and pipes. And is still portraying himself to be beautiful with music. And 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 12 says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So, yeah, no wonder why the music industry today is full of uh, perverse and these and these uh, the, these weird people like brother, brother Jeff mentioned, like these little Nas X rappers or whatever that are openly sodomites. You know, no wonder why the music industry is like that. No marvel. Because Satan himself is transforming in an image of light. That's why people give their money to these people by buying their records or, or whatever. Satan has done an exceeding excellent job at painting sin and wickedness in a glorious light through mainstream music today. Now, the type of music I want to preach on tonight is one of, if not the most popular uh, genre of music in the world, depending on where you look at for those, st uh, those statistics, and that's the hip-hop rap music uh, genre. And I'll be honest, I used to li listen to a lot of rap music growing up. Uh, it's kind of uh, 
the culture in the Bay Area, uh, California, you know, uh, some of you probably uh, have dealt with the same and grew up the same. Uh, but I I'm not exactly preaching on the entire genre of hip hop, but a particular rap artist who happens to probably be the most influential person in the hip hop music industry and is considered a, a pioneer, so to speak, for gangster rap, okay? And that's a man who went by the name of Tupac Amaru Shakur. Now, you're there in uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 45. Look at verse 45. It says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. The title of my sermon this evening is Tupac Shakur is in hell. Tupac Shakur is in hell. And what we're going to do this evening is audit the heart of Tupac Shakur. We're going to take a look at what this man believed by what came out of his own mouth. And we're going to take a look at interviews and lyrics from his own music and show you why I can stand before you with confidence in the Holy Spirit of God that this man, Tupac Shakur, is burning in hell tonight as we speak. Now, who is Tupac Shakur? I got this from Wikipedia. It says, Tupac Amaro Shakur, born Lizane Parish Crooks, born June 16th, 1971, and died September 13th, 1996, also known as Tupac, with a number two, and Machiavelli was an American rapper. He is widely considered one of the most influential rappers of all time. Shakur is among the best-selling music artists, having sold more than 75 million records worldwide. Much of Shakur's music has been noted for addressing contemporary social issues that plagued inner cities, and he is considered a symbol of activism against inequality. Shakur was born in New York City to parents who were both political activists and Black Panther Party members. And just a side note, if you're not familiar with the Black Panther Party, it's an open Marxist and Leninist, communist political organization. And again, just a little side note, um, outside the scope of the sermon, kind of, but both Karl Marx and Vladimir Lenin, uh, if you could say, uh, they were pioneers of communism. Uh, and both are quoted to hate Christianity. In fact, stating that atheism is the natural and inseparable part of communism, just a little food for thought, uh, just uh, to let you have some insight about some of the influences Tupac Shakur probably had uh, around him growing up from a young age. But Wikipedia continues, Raised by his mother, he relocated to Baltimore in 1984 and to the San Francisco Bay Area in 1988. And at age one, he was renamed Tupac Amaro Shakur. He was named after Tupac Amaro II, the descendant of the last Incan ruler who was executed in Peru in 1781 after his failed revolt against Spanish rule. Five more albums have been released since Shakur's death including his critically acclaimed posthumous album, The Don Caluminati, The Seven Day Theory, uh, released in 1996, under his stage name Machiavelli, all of which have been certified platinum in the United States. In 2002, Shakur was inducted into the Hip Hop Hall of Fame in 2017. He was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in his first year of eligibility. Rolling Stone Magazine ranked Shakur among the 100 greatest artists of all time. Again, why I preach a sermon like this? Well, it's to expose a major world influencer, to expose someone that is looked up to amongst people who would even consider themselves Christian. A lot of people believe this guy to be a Christian or a super spiritual person when he was actually far from that. Now, throughout this sermon, again, I'm going to be giving you all quotes from interviews and lyrics to his music, and I'm uh, just to cover each of my points, and I'm going to try to PG some of the stuff, okay, uh, that I'll be reading for you uh, this evening, because a lot of it's, you know, it's very explicit, you know. Turn to Second Peter, uh, Second Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. So for point number one, I'm coming out right away with the sure shot, with the kill shot, and that's Tupac did not believe the Bible. Tupac did not believe the Bible. Now, I have this interview from Vibe magazine. Supposedly, this is one of the last interviews uh, that he ever did, and the topic of God and religion was brought up. And, and, and keep in mind, this is full of expletives, so I'm changing the wording up a little bit, you know, but it still has the same meaning, okay? And this is what he says, quote, I talked to every God there was in jail. I think if you take one of the O's out of good, it's God. And if you add a D to evil, it's the devil. Very insightful. Very intelligent. He says, I think some cool MF sat down a long time ago and said, let's figure out a way we can control MFs. 
And that's what they came up with, the Bible. 2 Timothy chapter number 3 says this. You're not there, but 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. When the Bible here says the scriptures are inspired by God or inspiration of God, that means that God breathed these words, that this is God's spoken word, that God literally breathed these words into existence. Okay? 2 Peter chapter 1, look at verse 21. 2 Peter 1, 21, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So according to Tupac, every single holy man of God that had a hand in penning down God's word was just some MF. Yeah. It was just some MF who wanted the preeminence, who just wanted to control people. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. He goes on by saying this, but if God wrote the Bible, I'm sure there would have been a revised copy by now. You know what I mean? Because a lot of SH has changed and I've been looking for this revised copy and I don't see it. I still see the same old copy that they had from then. Hey, you know what? Amen that we still have the same old copy. Amen that we have the same old Bible, the same old word of God. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. That's what Jesus said. And apparently Tupac is mad about that. He was very mad about that. Tupac must have never heard or, or read the very first chapter or the very first verse of John, where it says that these words, this Bible is the word of God. Jesus says this, the words that I spake unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So you're there in first Corinthians chapter number 12. Look at verse three. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by, <clears throat> excuse me, speaking by the spirit of God calleth Jesus, uh, Jesus a curse. And that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. That no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. Now, not only does he clearly not believe what the Bible says, he clearly hates the Bible so much he wants a, a Bible version catered to him. Is that not what he, what, he, what he said? That he's looking for a revised copy and he just can't find it. Where is it? He wants it. He wants a Bible version specifically for him because he hates this Bible, the same old Bible, the same old word of God. He hates it so much. He wants a revised copy that caters to him. Is he not calling the holy men of God that were moved by the spirit of God? Just, just a bunch of MFs that are accursed. Is he not saying that? Is he not saying that the word of God himself is accursed? By calling holy men of God, look, just calling holy men, holy men of God, just some MFs that wanted to control people. Is that why they were beaten, mocked, humiliated, sawn asunder for Christ's sake? Uh, that's why they just wanted to control people. He says this, I believe God blesses those that hustle, those that use their mind and those that overall are righteous. Well, there's none righteous. No, not one according to the Bible. I believe that your karma, everything that you do bad comes back to you. Now, Look, we as Christians do believe for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Amen. That's what Jesus taught. That's what the Bible teaches. But we do not believe in karma. Okay. What that word karma is, it's Hinduism. Okay. We don't use karma, the word karma as a substitute for you reap what you sow. We're just going to use what the Bible says. We're going to use Bible terms. We're not going to insert Hinduism into the Bible. Okay. It's you reap what you sow. That's what Jesus said. Not karma. Okay. All right. And he goes on to say this. So anything I'm doing that's bad, I'm like, I'm going to have to suffer for. But I feel in my heart what I'm doing is right. You know what I mean? So I feel like I'm going to heaven. Well, Tupac, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's what the Bible says. Who is he trusting to get to heaven? Himself. His religion was mirrored after the world. We're all familiar with it. We, we hear it every single day out in the community, human achievement. But sadly, even by his own stupid standards, he wasn't even good enough for that. And we'll, and we'll get into that in a minute. But then he goes on to say that he doesn't even believe in heaven and hell. He says this, and I think heaven is just when you sleep. You sleep with a good conscience. You don't have nightmares. And hell is when you sleep. The last thing you see is all the messed up things you did in your life. And you see it over and over again because you don't burn. Because if that's the case, then it's hell on earth because bullets burn. You know what I mean? There's people that got burnt in fires. You know what I mean? That means they went to hell already. You know what I mean? All that is, all that is here, all that's here. So what else? What, what do you got there that we ain't seen yet? I don't know. Maybe the smoke of their torment sent it up forever and ever. I, I don't know. He says this, heaven is now. 
Look, we sitting up here, big screen. It's heaven for the moment. Hell is jail. I've seen that one. Trust me, this is what's real. And all the other SH is to control you. And let me tell you something right here, right now. Again, I said point number one is the sure shot. This is already the kill shot. Let me tell you something. From Ju today, July 31st, 2022, since way back when he died, September 13th, 1996, Tupac knows exactly what real hell's like. He knows exactly what it's like. I bet he's wishing he could feel the burns from bullets compared to what he's feeling right now. Compared to what he's feeling where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. That's what the Bible says hell is like. That's what Jesus Christ in the flesh said what hell's like. Where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. It's welling and gnashing of teeth. And let me tell you something. Tupac Shakur is in hell right now welling and gnashing his teeth. And he goes on to say this. It makes sense that if you're good in your heart, you're closer to God. But if you're evil, you're closer to the devil. That makes sense. I see that every day. Well, again, the Bible says the heart of men is wicked. Who can know it? So I'm going to take the Bible's word for it and say that Tupac's an idiot that knew nothing about the hearts of men. Okay. And another quote of his I found online, Tupac said this. I'm not really a religious person. But I believe that God wants me to do something, and it has to do with thug life. Again, an absolute fool did not believe the Bible whatsoever, okay? Point number two is this. Tupac was a stupid, blasphemous, antichrist piece of dung. He was a stupid, antichrist, blasphemous, antichrist piece of dung, okay? In that same interview from Vibe Magazine, he says this. I'm not disrespecting anybody's religion. Please forgive me if it comes off like that. I'm just stating my opinion. Well, your opinion is dung. Your opinion is crap. I feel like we get crucified. I mean, the Bible's telling that all these people did this because they suffered, the, uh, they suffered this much, and that's what makes them special people. I got shot five times. Not for Christ, you didn't. I got shot five times. And right when he says this, he, he portrays himself, counting one through five, as him getting nailed to a cross. He's like, one, two, three, four, five. I got crucified. I got shot five times. He says, you know what I mean? And I got crucified to the media. You know what I mean? And I walked through with the thorns on and I had an SH thrown on me and I had the thief at the top and I told uh, that him that I'll be back for you. You know what I mean? Trust me, this is not supposed to be going down. I'll be back. So I'm not saying I'm Jesus, but you did. But I'm saying that we go through that type of thing every day. We don't part the Red Sea but we walk through the hood without getting shot. You know what I mean? We don't turn water to wine, but we turn MF and dope fiends and dope heads into profitable and productive citizens in society. You know what I mean? We turn words into money. You know what I mean? What greater gift can it be? So I believe God blesses us. I believe God blesses those that hustle. Just a complete joke and mockery of the word of God. Complete blasphemy, if you ask me. And after mocking the death of our Lord and Savior, and mocking the Bible, okay, after all that, on the cover of his Machiavelli album, the, uh, the last album I guess he worked on by himself uh, up until his point of death, it came out after he died, called the Don Caluminati, the Seven Day Theory. It, it, the cover of the album is a drawing of himself nailed to a cross with a crown of thorns on his head. But he, he's not calling himself Jesus. Okay, okay, give me a break, okay? If that's not blasphemy, I don't know what is. He designed that album cover. He designed everything on that album up until the point he died. That's what he did. He wanted that. I mean, that interview that I just read for you, that, that's what he portrayed himself as, as Christ. But, oh, no, 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 I'm not saying I'm Christ, but you did. You said you had thorns on your head and you got crucified. Come on, man. Now, the first song on that album is called Bomb First where he starts the song by calling his lyrics spiritual lyrics like the Holy Quran, and that all he wants is money, hoes, fornication, and weed. Super spiritual, right? Sounds like a super spirit of Satan. The second song in the album is called Hail Mary. Now, does the Bible say anything about Hail Mary? No, rather the Bible says in Luke 11 verse 27, we actually have a story in the Bible of someone trying to Hail Mary. It says, and it came to pass, as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee, and the paps that which thou hast sucked. So we have this person going up to Jesus. Hey, hail Mary! Bless your mom! 
Well, what do you think Jesus is going to say? I'll read it for you. But he said, yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Amen. Blessed are they who uh, hail Jesus, right. who hail the word of God. Right. We don't hail Mary, okay? We don't worship Mary. Uh, remember when Jesus' family wanted to speak with him? Remember what he said? Who is my mother? Or, who, who, behold my mother and my brethren, pointing to the believers. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother, my sister, my mother. Like, it doesn't, make any, it doesn't even make any sense. Like, what is he, a Muslim, a Catholic, talking about the Quran and Holy Mary? Just a complete fool. A bunch of nonsense. Okay? He, he starts the song, Hail Mary. He says this. Come with me, Hail Mary, run quick see. And God said, and this is, this is what he says in the song. And God said he should send his one begotten son to lead the wild into the ways of the man. Follow me, eat my flesh, flesh of my flesh. Again, just more mocking the Bible, mocking God, mocking Christ. Here's some quotes from, the, uh, from that song, Hail Mary. We're too crazy to be humble. Hell, till I reach hell, I ain't scared. One life to live, but I got nothing to lose. Mark 8, verse 36 says this, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Well, evidently, Tupac, he exchanged his soul for booze and money. He wanted, he wanted fame. That's what he wanted. Another song in the album is called Blasphemy. In the second verse of the song, Tupac states, We're probably in hell already. Our dumbass is not knowing. Everybody kissing ass to go to heaven ain't going. But my soul on it, or put my soul on it, I'm fighting devil and words daily. Plus the media be crucifying brothers severely. Tell me I ain't God's son. Mama a virgin. No, you're not God's son. You sound like a bastard. He says in the same song, criminal mind all the time. Wait for judgment day. They say Moses split the Red Sea. I split the blunt and rolled a fat one up deadly. Yeah, yeah, okay, it's super spiritual. He says, still BSing. N-words in Jerusalem waiting for signs. God coming. She's just taking her time. Ha, ha, ha. Mocking God, calling God a woman. That, that's, God's coming. She's just taking her time. That's, you know what that reminded me of? That sounds like that one faggot um, uh, a politician over in Missouri that was like, amen, and a woman yeah. for his prayer. That, that, that's, that's the spirit of Tupac. That's what he said. He says, living by the Nile while, uh, while the water flow, I'm contemplating plots, wonder where they'll go. Brothers getting shot, coming back resurrected. Mocking the resurrection. He ends the song with these words. I leave this and hope God sees my heart is pure. Is heaven just another door? Well, Psalm 24, verses 3 through 6 says this. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul in a vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. So Tupac's heart was not pure. He did lift his soul up in a vanity. And he did swear deceitfully. Okay? In the song, Only God Can Judge Me, Tupac states at the end of the song that his only fear of death is coming back reincarnated. Again, just mocking the Bible, mocking God every chance he, every chance he got. And you know what? Yes, God, he, he is judging you. And you know what? Uh, that's why you're in hell right now. And he's not finished judging you. There's something called the Great White Throne Judgment coming up. We're going to get that little, little bit of break of, you know, hell before you get tossed into the lake of fire, okay? I bet he's, I bet he's looking forward to that, right? So point number one was this. He didn't believe the Bible whatsoever. Point number two is he is a blasphemous piece of garbage, okay? Point number three is this. Tupac was a womanizer and pervert. Tupac was a womanizer and pervert. The following article was posted as recent as June 4th, 2021 on a pro-Tupac website called TupacLegacy.net. And the article is about a case against Tupac that stems from a November 1993 accusation of him raping a 19-year-old girl. The night 
of, it says this, the night of the sexual assault incident was November 18th, 1993. Literally, literally three weeks before that, Tupac is in Atlanta and he shoots two off-duty police officers because he sees them accosting a black driver. At that point in time, you would think that him shooting two off-duty police officers would be the biggest legal hurdle. But that November, he's introduced to Ayanna Jackson at Nell's nightclub. Allegedly, they go to a corner of the club to perform activities and they go back to his hotel. I think that part is pretty much accepted. Everything after that is all about who you choose to believe. I truly believe, and I'm not exercising any hyperbole when I say this, this is the single most impactful, consequential case in rap history because the chain of events that happens after November 18th alters the course of rap. It goes on to say, four days after the incident at Nell's, Ayanna Jackson returned to Tupac's hotel suite. The two were there with Tupac's manager, Charles Man Man Fuller, Haitian Jack, and a friend of Jack's remained unidentified. Jackson claimed that she was forced to perform activities on Tupac while Jackson undressed her, and then she was forced to perform more activities on Jack's friend while Tupac held her down. Tupac claimed that he had left the room when the other men came in and didn't see what happened after. Keep that in mind. He claimed that he didn't see anything, that he left the room. Jackson sought out hotel uh, security, and Tupac, Jack, and Fuller were arrested. The unidentified man was never located. Tupac and Fuller were charged with first-degree sexual abuse, sodomy, and illegal possession of a firearm since police found two guns in the hotel room. Haitian Jack's case was separated, and he later pleaded guilty to lesser charges. Tupac's trial began in November 1994. Later in the article, it reads, in the Ed Gordon interview on BET, he says, I can't leave until people actually know that I am not guilty of this. It, uh, the, the article goes on, even still something happened in that hotel room. Something clearly happened. In the Vibe interview from 1995, he said, even though I'm innocent of the, of the charge they gave me, uh, I'm not innocent in terms of the way I was acting. I don't know if uh, she was with these guys or if she's mad at me for not protecting her, but I feel ashamed because I wanted to be accepted. I didn't want, to har I didn't want no harm done to me. I didn't say anything. So there is this level of responsibility there, regardless of what anyone believes did or did not happen that night. Tupac said it himself. He didn't do enough to stop it. At best, he looked the other way. Those aren't my words. Those aren't uh, your words. Those are his exact words. So he says at, at one point of time that he didn't know what happened. He walked out of the room. He had no idea. And then right here, he says he turned the other way. But he just didn't want people to judge him, pretty much. He just didn't want to feel ashamed. Sounds like an admission to me. The article goes on, when we think about this case, we've got to look at all entry points, all levels of complexities, because it's not just, did he do this? Maybe he didn't. But in his own words, he was complicit in what happened. Tupac feared for himself and protected himself over protecting Ayanna Jackson. Tupac was ultimately convicted of first-degree sexual abuse and sentenced to one and a half to four and a half years in prison. During the sentencing, Justice Daniel P. Fritzgerald said, that was an act of brutal violence against a helpless woman. Addressing the judge, Tupac said, I mean this with no disrespect, judge. You never paid attention to me. You never looked in my eyes. You never used the wisdom of Solomon. I always felt you had something against me. Well, this Bible-believing Baptist church is using the wisdom of Solomon. It's going to guarantee, we're guaranteeing today that we're going to use the wisdom of God with the Bible. And I guarantee you, Tupac was not innocent in this because something did happen. He admitted it. And look, this is a website that I'm reading to you from that's all about supporting Tupac and his so-called legacy. And even they can't hide the fact that he is a pervert. They, a, a pro-Tupac website wrote this article. And it shows that they can't hide it. They can't hide what, what he did. And, and, and look, when it comes to cases like this, you know, with, I mean, it, you could choose if you want to, because, you know, people lie. You know, that's what happens, you know, and you could choose yourself, you know, if you want to believe you did it or not, that, that's besides the point. When it comes to the case, with cases like this with no definitive answer, we as Christians need to be able to look at it like this. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.22, it says, abstain from all appearance of evil. So if Tupac was this spiritual and righteous person, which he definitely wasn't, why would he have been in a situation like this to begin with? 
It doesn't make any sense unless he put himself there. It was recently stated from the victim within the last few years, because I guess like three years ago, she came out and did an interview about it. Uh, um, she says that he gave her a, ha uh, a half-hearted apology, saying, I apologize. I'm not apologizing for a crime. I hope in time you'll come forth and tell the truth. I am innocent. So it's like, why are you apologizing? If you really didn't do anything, why even, why even apologize? Why even open your mouth? It doesn't make any sense. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And look, that's not even going into the scores and scores of his own lyrics, talking about being a pervert, deviant, adulterous slime ball. You know, I mean, his own music can be evidence against him. You know, his own music is admission. You know, it, we don't even have time to get into all that. And it kinda, that kind of leads into my fourth point, is Tupac knew he was a reprobate. Tupac knew that he was rejected by God. I have lyrics for you from a song called Shed So Many Tears. He says this in the song, Now that I'm struggling in this business by any means, label me greedy getting green, but seldom seen. And F the world because I'm cursed. I'm having visions of leaving here in a hearse. God, can you feel me? Take me away from all the pressure and all the pain. Show me some happiness again. I'm going blind. I spend my time in this cell ain't living well. I know my destiny is hell. Where did I fail? My life is in denial. And when I die, baptized in eternal fire, shed so many tears. Look, you got that right, Tupac. You've been shedding tears in that eternal fire for almost 30 years now. You know, and, and remember I read for you earlier from his song, Hail Mary, that he knows he's going to reach hell and he ain't scared. Why, why is he shedding tears then? Why, why are you so beat up about it? It's because he knows that destination is real. He knew that hell is real in his heart. You know, God's law is written on the hearts of everybody, even the reprobate. They're just, they, their conscience just happens to be seared, you know, to, to loving the law of God. But they know that the filth and, and vile acts that they commit are worthy of death. They know that they're a reprobate. They know the judgment of God. That's what Romans 1 said. Who knowing the judgment of God is what it says. He knew he was a reprobate concerning the faith, okay? Uh, he goes on to say in the song, Now I'm lost and I'm weary, so many tears. I'm suicidal, so don't stand near me. My every move is a calculated step to bring me closer to embrace an early death. Now there's nothing left. There was no mercy on the streets. I couldn't rest. I'm barely standing, about to go to pieces, screaming peace. And though my soul was deleted, I couldn't see it. I had my mind full of demons trying to break free. They planted seeds and they hatched, sparking the flame. Inside my brain like a match, such a dirty game. Again, acknowledging his reprobate condition, acknowledging the fact that he's on his way to hell. He says, no memories, just misery. Painting a picture of my enemies killing me in my sleep. Will I survive till the morning to see the sun? Please, Lord, Forgive me for my sins, because here I come. And he ends the song saying, begging for the Lord to let him into heaven's door. Shed so many tears. Now, reading the lyrics of this song, I can't help but remember Matthew chapter 7. Let me turn there for you real quick. You don't have to turn there, but let me just, let me just read for you. This, this is what it reminds me of. Okay, Matthew chapter 7, I believe it's uh, verse 21. This, this is what Tupac is saying right here. Verse 21 in Matthew chapter 7. You can turn there if you want. It says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. That's, that, that's what those verses remind me of, that he knows his destiny is hell. Please, Lord, forgive me for my sins. Lord, don't hear you. You're, you're a reprobate piece of crap, and you know that. That's why you wrote these lyrics. That's why you wrote songs called Hail Mary and Blasphemy. Okay? But, but again, there's a lot of people these days that, oh, he's super spiritual. Tupac was a worker of iniquity. Okay? He, how does God feel? Again, remind me. How does God feel about workers of iniquity? He hates them. He hates them. And there's a quote from his song called Nothing to Lose, where he says, I pray to my God every day, but he don't listen. And, you know, you, you can't help but wonder, 
Well, what God is your God? What God are you praying to? You said you talked to every God there is. You're talking to a bunch of devils. That's what he was doing. He's not praying to the Lord Jesus Christ or God the Father. He's praying to whatever God of the Quran, the Holy Quran is. Or what he said there, you pray to every God there is. Well, how many gods are there again? I don't know, one. So if you're praying to all these other gods, you're praying to devils. You're worshiping devils, okay? Here's some lyrics from the song titled, Good Life. Should be good, right? He starts the song off by saying, I was so money-orientated, initiated as a thug, fiended for wicked adventures, ambitious as I was. Picture uh, an N-word on the verge of living insane. I sold my soul for a chance to kick it and bang. Now, okay, I, I don't believe, okay, let's just get it straight. I don't really believe that someone can physically like sell their soul to the devil. We're giving the devil a little bit too much credit there because, you know, you can find lyrics like this from any mainstream uh, artist um, in the music industry. You know, they all have at least one song where they tell you they sold their soul to the devil. And I believe it in a sense that they've been given over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, okay? And they're full of wicked inventions. I mean, they write a lot of times, like Tupac, he wrote his own music. That's a wicked invention. And these wicked inventions, they come from the imaginations of their own wicked heart, okay? So, yeah, they sell their soul to the devil in, in, in a way that they've been give, given over to a reprobate mind, okay? That they rejected God. That, that's what that is. They didn't physically, like, write on a contract in blood or something, you know? Oh, you know, I sold my soul to the devil for riches and fame. And it's like that, but it's not like that, okay? They, you know, I'll get into that in a second, you know? Because there's nothing new under the sun, okay? You know, I, I've, I've told some of you guys before, just talking outside of service, that, you know, again, there's nothing new in the sun. And I personally believe if there's nothing new in the sun, the same weird, vile, wicked things that people did thousands of years ago that God warned us about, you know, like incest and bestiality and homosexuality, there's nothing new under the sun, my friend. So I'm a firm believer that the most vile and disgusting acts imaginable uh, that people were doing thousands of years ago for the devil, the same is happening today, okay? And, and I, I just, this is my opinion. You don't have to agree with me, but I believe that in order for these rich people, like these million, like multi-millionaire people in the music industry or Hollywood, I personally believe in order to get that million-dollar payday, they have to do something weird. They have to do something gross. Like all of us would have to, Ugh, you know, they have to do that. That's just my opinion because it, a lot of these people, like, uh, like, for instance, like, I guess, you know, not to glorify Michael Jackson at all, but I guess he, like, he was, like, you know, kind of trying to expose the Illuminati or something like that or whatever. But they always, like, bring, whenever they try to open their mouth to truth, or, or, like, Jim Carrey tried to do it recently or something like that, they always, as soon as they open their mouth, there's always some article that comes out about something weird that they did, you know. So I, I believe that they have to do that weird thing, you know, that vile thing, you know, in order to get that million dollar payday, but if they ever open their mouth, that thing's hung over their head, but that thing that they did, I mean, the only way they did that was because they were given over to that reprobate mind. It's a lot to get into, but if you read Romans 1, it, it makes sense. You know, in order to be a reprobate, you have to be given over to that and do those. Things. Yeah, it's a whole thing. And another thing, you know, Tupac in almost all his songs had a weird obsession with death and dying and seeing other people dead, whether it was before or after he got shot, you know, so... Uh, what, is, what does the Bible say? All them that hate me love death. You know, so if he's obsessed with these things, I mean, you know, he loves death. He hates God. But again, these wicked music, musicians, they sell out for money. They sell out for fame. They, say, they sell out in that respect, okay? They don't physically sell their soul to the devil, okay? First Timothy chapter 6. And then First Timothy chapter 6, look at verse number 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. So they covet after money and fame. They, they, they all want that glory, you know, all the pomp to the point of erring from the faith. And what, what happens? They, they pierce themselves through with many sorrows. That's why, this is what I believe that that's why they have to say these things in music. Because they're, 
they're erred from the faith, they're reprobate concerning the faith, and something in their mind, something in their heart almost forces them to just let it all out, you know, and just tell you, like, my life is in shambles, I'm a wicked, vile person, and they put that in their music. That's just my belief. Turn to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Because if you think about it, they can't help but tell the audience about it. You know, they just can't help it, you know. Uh, they can't help but tell you that they're a reprobate, you know. And that's, that's what we see out in the community, too, with just your average reprobate person. They can't help but let you know they're a reprobate. They can't help to let you know that they, that they hate God. Point number five is this. Tupac glorified sin, if you couldn't already tell. Tupac glorified sin from the song Hearts of Men. He says this, so many rumors, but I'm infinite, a mortal outlaw. Switching up on you ordinary bees, like a southpaw you get left. And every breath I breathe until the moment I'm deceased will be another moment bawling as a G. I rip the crowd and I start again. Eternally, I live in sin. And, you know, I don't think you can listen to a single one of his songs without hearing him glorify his criminal mindedness. He tells you right there, he eternally lives in and Sam, one of the number one things he calls himself in almost probably every single one of his songs is he calls himself a thug. Now, according to Webster's Dictionary, the definition for thug is a violent or brutish criminal. Now, what does it mean when someone is brutish? It means that they show little intelligence. It means they're an idiot. A thug, so if you take that definition and apply it, a thug is a stupid, violent criminal. That's what it is. In fact, in that same song, Hearts of Men, he says that thugging is in his spirit. And what kind of spirit does a stupid, violent criminal have? Well, one that God hates. Okay, Psalm 11, verse 5 says, The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked in him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. So, Tupac is hated by God. Okay, he not only glorified his thug lifestyle, but he glorified his alcoholism. More lyrics from that song I quoted earlier called Good Life. Now tell me if I'm wrong, but saying F the world got you deeper in my songs. Drinking till I earl, spending money till it's gone. It's the good life. Maybe N-Word's got it going on. Now maybe if I died and came back, I wouldn't have to slang crack. So he, <laughs> he's literally saying drinking until you vomit is the good life and proceeds to mock the resurrection. That's like a constant thing for him. And time will fail me to read more of his lyrics that just, it's just about every single one of his songs where, where he's talking about selling crack and drinking booze until he's passed out cold. I mean, that, that's, that's the rap music industry, especially of the 90s of, you know, his era. Uh, what else? He, he also glorified fornication and adultery. His song, Heaven Ain't Hard to Find, is all about seducing women and fornicating. In his diss track titled Hit Him Up, Tupac gloats about committing adultery with another rapper named Christopher Wallace's wife. And you know, again, he's gloating about these things. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 14, verse 9, that fools make a mockery at sin. Okay? So, but, but I, I believe that Tupac was more than just a fool. I believe he was a reprobate, just doing enough research on what he believed and preached through his own music. Uh, I believe he was a reprobate, uh, a very stupid one at that. Uh, now, now look with with all these, uh, with all of these, you know, these points that I made. You know, you can apply this to any rapper. You know, whether it be from the '80s with N.W.A., LL Cool J, or whatever, the '90s, the 2000s, so even today, it's probably it's probably just as bad, if not even worse today, because you got a bunch of homos or whatever. You know, Tupac isn't unique, you know. He's just a perfect example because he's a pioneer of rap music. He's uh, reverenced as, uh, like, the number one hip artist of all time in many circles and many forums online. And Brother Jeff mentioned the, uh, this morning, the Bible says that men shall be lovers of their own selves. So all these rappers do is talk about themselves. You know, like, for example, like Dr. Dre, Dr. Dre this, Dr. Dre that. Uh, Snoop Dogg, Snoop Doggy Dog this, and Snoop Doggy Dog that. Like Snoop Dogg, I think he literally has a song named Snoop Dogg where he's literally just, the chorus is just him spelling out his name. Like, 
conceited much? Lover of your own self much? <laughs> you know, like, how long do you look in the mirror in the morning, man? But I have to come up with that, you know? Again, Tupac isn't in the minority, all right, when it comes to all this garbage. He just happens to be a massive figure, okay, in this industry. Not only in America, though, but worldwide. You know, he, he has major influence globally, surprisingly, right? And again, why I preach a sermon like this? Because we as God's people need to make sure we're sober and vigilant. Because we need to be aware of the surroundings of this world. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 says this, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So let it not be said of the children of God, especially the ones inside this church, that, uh, that we're ignorant to the devil and his device called the mainstream uh, music industry, okay? So, two, uh, so uh, point number one is this. Tupac did not believe the Bible. He did not believe in God. He didn't believe in the God of the Bible. In fact, any chance he had, he mocked God, which, I mean, I gave you more than enough examples of that. Point number two was this. Tupac was a blasphemous dirtbag. Tupac was a woman, and point number three was Tupac was a womanizer, an adulterer, a whoremonger, just an all-around deviant pervert. Uh, I couldn't even read lyrics for you. I just gave you the song titles. Don't look them up. Um, and point number four was this. He knew he was a reprobate. Just by his lyrics, you can tell he knew in his heart he was rejected by God. He knew his eternal destination. He, he said it in himself that he was going to be baptized in eternal fire. Well, there's only one place that happens. is It's hell. Uh, verse, and uh, point number five was this. Tupac glorified and wallowed in his sin. He loved his sin. He said eternally he lives in sin. Okay? You're there in Matthew chapter 12. Look at verse 35. It says, a good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. And that's why I can stand before you today and tell you with confidence that Tupac Shakur is burning in hell. Let's all bow our heads in a word of prayer. Dear Father God, I just want to thank you for, uh, for allowing me to preach, Lord, and I uh, just thank you for everything that went on today with Brother Jeff's um, uh, preaching this morning and uh, all the songs that we got to sing today that glorify you and uplift you and what you do for us day in and day out, Lord. And Lord, we just ask you to please uh, let us be a people that wouldn't glorify the so-called idols of the world today and uh, these wicked people, and whether it be the mainstream music industry or uh, the film industry, the ho Hollywood uh, industry, Lord, we just pray that we stray far away from these people. And if any of us in here that are dealing with these things, Lord, that you'd help us out with that. And uh, just take something from the sermon to realize that uh, Tupac, he's not unique in these, uh, in these points, Lord, that you could probably apply these points to every single person in the music industry. Uh, they're all wicked, they're all perverts, and they're all just a bunch of weirdos, Lord. We just pray that, uh, that you'd uh, help us uh, uh, just be far from that, Lord, and set our hearts on you and uh, music that glorifies you. And I just pray that you, uh, that you watch over us and uh, lead us all safely to our homes this evening and bring us all to our place this, uh, this Wednesday. And we just also pray for the safe travels for a pastor and his family. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.